event of the semester, we'll have Dr. Leon Chen and we have Mr. Nguyen as well. So they'll be presenting on plotting with R using the bank data set. So thank you both so much for presenting and thank you for those that were able to make it and be a supporter. Oh, yes. Okay, first of all, thank you for coming to today's presentation. Um, our presentation has two parts. The first part, I'm going to present a brief summary of analytics tools. And then after that, I will ask my students, Anthony, to present his research topic about risk. So about analytics tools, we always have some discussion. Say, what tools I need to learn? And uh, how many tools? How many analytics tools do we have to have? And uh, we always have this kind of discussion. And recently we received email. Uh, I think that one student sent an email to me and Dr. Bob to say, oh, which tool I need to use? Why drop the minor? This kind of uh, discussion is very interesting. So today I'm going to bring some discussion about that topic. First of all, let's take a look at the survey result. This is from Katie Nugget. Uh, so it shows the share of each analytics tool among all the participants and also share the share across years. As you can see, no, number one is Python. <clears throat> so over, I mean, over 60% of all the participants have used Python in the past 12 months. And in 2015, or before that, R was the dominant one, and now the Python has already outperformed R. And next one is shows Rapid Miner. Uh, compared with Python, Rapid Miner is more user friendly, so you just click, click, and then build the process, and then you get the results. But R and Python uh, involve some programming uh, skills. Of course, this just shows just one survey result. We have some other survey results. If you take a look at those results, we see Python is number one, R is number two, and then Excel and SQL and TensorFlow, all the other tools. But this at least gives us impression that so R, Python, and uh, some user-friendly tools are quite popular. And if you take a look at this, you can see for Python, it's increased from the market share increased from 2017 to 2019. And the same for uh, Rap Miner, but there's a slight drop in 2019. But for R, already has 56.7% market share, but recently it dropped to 46.7%. Uh, to give us an idea about those tools. Another thing you can see, most of those tools are free, except Excel. But because Microsoft Office is so popular nowadays, mm, <clears throat> I think every computer has Excel. But for the Python, Rust Miner, R, and uh, Anokada, and C, and TensorFlow, all of them, uh, not all of them, Rust Miner you have to pay, but for our students, we can use educational license, you can use it for free. But for R, Python, TensorFlow, all of them, uh, open source software, so it's free to use, so that's why they are quite popular. And this slide uh, shows that those market, uh, those machine learning platforms, you have uh, leaders and challengers and leadership players, as you can see on the very uh, right top, you have the right miner there, and they also have SAS <clears throat> and Nine, all those who are there. And for Rust Miner and Nine, for them it's user friendly. You just click. You don't need any programming techniques. And SAS, you they have two versions. One version you need to have some coding skill, but the other version so you just also can click, click, click. So every even a normal person can become uh, a master of business analytics using those easy tools. But this diagram did not show those open source software such as R and Python. So now I'll just, we are going to take a look at the survey results from our students. In my data analytic seminar course, each semester at the first week, I send a survey to my students. They ask my students to answer a few questions. One of the questions is, what tools have 
you used in the past <clears throat> six months and then ask you to make a selection. I give them a few choice. These those popular ones there like Microsoft's uh, Excel, Python, and Power BI, Tableau, R there. So the, of course, I give them other options. If you use some other tools, just specify the tool name there. In the past few years, this tool bank increased to 40. That means some students use some tools which are not listed here, but I compare all of them together, I got total 40. <clears throat> but many of them have been used just one or two students. Very interesting. As you can see, first of all, Microsoft Excel over almost everyone used Microsoft Excel except in my class, just the four or about four percent of students have never used this. <clears throat> and then next one is SQL and uh, Google Analytics and Python and Power BI. But of course, up, after this class, because in my class I introduced Tableau and uh, Graph Miner and SQL. So that means after this class, those Graph Miner and SQL and uh, Tableau should be 100%. <laughs> but I used this one at the beginning of the class. I just want to see students' background about all analytics tools. <clears throat> and from 2018 to 19, you can see there's a slight increase in terms of average number of analytical tools that our students have used. So from 2.4 uh, to 2.51. But even for the Excel, say almost everyone indicated they use Excel, but their label varies greatly. Some of them just, oh, I can open Excel file. Some of others can use uh, Excel for regression and analysis. And some other can use Excel for simulation. And some other can use Excel for table. They have different label. Even many of them say they have they use Excel. And next, I expect that today we have some econ faculty or student here, but if not, that's fine. So I also compare our C the CIDN 6308 and Econ 6308 because this course is cross list listed. So Excel, almost everyone used, but for SQL, our CIDN students, 48% of them used, but for Econ students, only 21%. But for all other tools, you can see the, the green bar is higher than the red bar, indicating that uh, CIDM students have used those tools more frequently than Econ students. And of course, they also, in, uh, in total, CIDM students report they used 27 tools in our list, but Econ, they report they used 26, but most of them do not override. And most of them just those, maybe they use those tools in their job, <clears throat> Next, I'm going to present uh, the survey results from our Python. Uh, originally, we used Python and R, and now we use the Cloud Analytics survey. So, from this in this, in this summer, we used uh, to send a survey to our students and faculty members. We can we receive 104 responses, and 94 percent of them from COB, and uh, with a majority of them for our graduate students and then um, faculty members. And as you can see, a lot of them indicate that analytics is at least important for their position. So that gives us a very good chance to promote our business analytics community. And this one just shows some tools they have used it before. Again, Microsoft Excel, has been used by 84% of our uh, students. And uh, then SQL, Graph Miner, Tableau, Python, and R and R Studio Power BI. This is kind of like the second group. And then for some other stuff, SPSS data and MATLAB have been used by about 10% of our participants. <clears throat> this tool can give us a, a good idea about what tools have been used by our students and faculty members. Some tools may be used only for research. Some other tools may be used, can be used for their job, their position. So this can help us how we can uh, promote and what our activities in our cloud analytics community. And in addition, we may can uh, cover different tools across time, this time R and this time, this time Python, to attract more 
uh, participants and to attract to increase their interest in learning analytics tools. Because we pay attention to R and Python, and then we ask them, are you interested in learning R and Python? So we, the results show that a very high percentage of our students want to use R and Python. <coughs> but there's a challenge there. In my class, uh, I have two online class. I used uh, for one class, we use R exclusively. Of course, we included a little bit Rust Miner and um, R in business forecasting. In data mining course, I combine both R and Rust Miner. Uh, students sometimes, in, especially in the beginning of this semester, students always have some complaints or struggles. It's very hard for me to type the code and they have problems here. So how we can solve this kind of problem? And um, here I just did provide one option how we can teach those analytics tools in online class. So one of the options is we can combine <coughs> user-friendly tools such as Rack Miner 9, TensorFlow, and uh, those programming tools such as R and Python. Rack Miner, there's a good advantage for Rack Miner so you can do the data mining step by step. So you can see the process very visually. So that can help students understand the mining process. But if they put into the code, so, so we see a lot of lines of codes there. So they don't know what's going on there. Therefore, we put back miner first. We run some data mining models in back miner. And then they are going to repeat what they did in back miner in R as well. So that the, first of all, they have an idea. Oh, I need to clean the data. I need to select target mark, a target variable. and then I need to evaluate my model. And in R, so they can follow the same logic to write their code. So I send a survey to my students and ask them, how do, do they perceive such a combination? And uh, as you can see, a very high percentage of students indicate that such a integration make this course more valuable and make them uh, have a better understanding of data mining concepts and also have increased their capability to conduct data mining. And then they can understand each tool's pros and cons because each time I always have the problem. I always have a question for them. Compare these two tools and do we get the same results? If not, why? And ask them some questions so they can, they can do some research to compare the algorithm uh, in Rack Miner and R. Of course, this course, this is we have some challenge there as well, and the students, 45% of the students say, okay, such an integration frustrates me. Uh, they prefer one tool. But interestingly, we also have 45% of here. They somewhat disagree or strongly disagree. So you come have a few extremes. Some of them, oh, yeah, it's good, combination. It did not frustrate me. But some other group of students, 45%, yeah, it's frustrating me. And such integration makes this course more challenging. You see, seventy-eight percent of them say yes. It makes this course more challenging. But when I take a look at students' comments, they say, "Yeah, this course is more challenging." But I think graduate students, graduate course, are supposed to be challenging. So we cannot give them the easy questions, and then they can do that. <clears throat> and here, this is the last question. I wish I could focus on one tool. You can see, forty-one percent of them okay, focus on one tool, and another forty-one percent is okay. We prefer, maybe we disagree with that. We, <clears throat> so it's very interesting using this integration, we can see two extremes. But overall, such integration makes this course more valuable and increase students' capability to perform data mining. I think that is, that, is, that, is, that is our goal. Students may frustrate a little, a little bit, but that is their, once they pass the learning curve, so I think they can, uh, perform data mining and learn some other and uh, tools more uh, successfully. Leon, mm -hmm. do you want us to ask questions now or later? Um, your your choice. Okay, uh, I, have, I have two more slides. Okay, go ahead. And then, okay, what's next? Because just now I presented analytical tools, but tools are not everything for analytics. Later we are going to cover some analytical skills. What skills we need to have? Of course, we can have these skills in multiple tools or just one single tool. And next one, we are, when we cover analytics top, 
topics, what kind of topics we can cover. And here, just give you one example. This is about students' skills in each uh, analytical uh, function and topic. Okay, and next, just um, my students, Anthony, did a very good job in my data mining course and data analytics course. And uh, he always walked additional mile in my class. He did uh, always did a good job and later, is going to present his research topic, which was presented in academic conference and also in WP conference. And uh, he won first place prize. Congratulations. Okay, you're welcome to ask any question. Yeah. Um, the frustration, do you think it's because the students find R hard to learn, or was the frustration because it's redundant? <clears throat> I think the the first the first part because when I take students uh, teaching evaluation comments and this, their comments in the survey, one student just don't want don't like R don't like programming, and they say, oh, okay, I I'm, I was very frustrated with programming. Sometimes I have the code exactly as you provided in my in the instruction. Why I did not got the correct answer? Just sometimes not they have typo here. The, they cannot read the error message. They cannot solve the problem. That is the, I think that is the major problem that make them feel frustrated. Or, or maybe the extra challenge is added to the, to the course, like comparing the two tools. This is like adding an extra challenge. So that might be like the frustration mm -hmm. thing come from. Yes, of course. I think that may be a good uh, solution. Maybe we can do something to make them feel more comfortable to handle two tools. For example, maybe we have FAQs summarize all the student, all the questions asked by previous students, and then we're going to provide FAQ and students. Oh, and we have the similar questions. We're going to check FAQ and another. Uh, this year, I asked them to do some warm-up exercise. Uh, I asked them, I provide them a website and so that they can do some basic R programming skills here using within one hour. So they can do that exercise first so that they, uh, they have some warm-up exercise before entering into all those coding in this class. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Good. Well, I like what you said in the word challenging, um, getting to know our students, which we're all getting to know them together, right? We're all teaching in these courses, but uh, this is tantamount to a departmental meeting, so I'll just speak to that level. Um, it's our job, uh, and it's my it's my statement, so you don't have to agree with me, Dr. Chen, but mm -hmm. I, I'm proposing it's our job to set their expectations. So I, too, encounter their dissatisfaction with the messiness of this. But as I was saying before your presentation, I believe we're facilitating the gold rush right now. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they want to get out and be efficacious in the marketplace. <clears throat> and we need to strike a balance between the sandbox experiences, which reduce their cognitive load and increase their enjoyment with the truth which is that the employer expects them to jump into a mess because nobody has the solution to any of this yet. They just see Google and all the other big, real big players developing real value out of analytics. And everybody hopes they can too. Just like, let's all get a website out in the late 90s. <laughs> and then that, that imploded because people didn't know how to take the value of it. I think our program has a, a strength and advantage by saying, well, it integrates with other parts. So, I appreciate your research, by the way, because it puts fine points onto what I'm developing an emotional sense of. Well, I would ask all of us to consider establishing um, expectations for our students so they realize that some of this pain is necessary. Right? Mm -hmm. And that we weather their storm. I, I haven't raised children, but I think a lot of people in the room um, are. And I imagine that sometimes you have to weather the storm with your children because they have to. Uh, acquire 
some growth, right? So mm -hmm. that's helpful for me to see what they want out of their experience. And then the journey they have to go on it. And some of that journey is going to be pain. And we're just going to have to have these kind of discussions. So that you couched it in a presentation, I really appreciate it. Yes, that reminds me of the discussion in our uh, advisory board meeting. Yeah. I think some, <clears throat> our, some, some of our <clears throat> board members mentioned that it's okay for them to feel in class, but if we can make them successful in the real right. world, so it worked well. It is. <clears throat> so I think that I surveying it and getting them to be getting to be palpable and even these types of discussions let us strike the balance. I do think some sandbox or training wheels, those, those sound pejorative, I don't mean them to be pejorative, are important. But then also giving them opportunities to achieve the frustration. Because I always tell them, and I, you were probably all the same experience, the amount of time that goes by where I'm playing with code, there's not frustration, right? It's never perfect, you know what I mean? <laughs> Every experience I have sitting down with this has me have to look it up and frustrating, why isn't this working? And I, I my neighbor here, I hear him doing the, <laughs> but we, we all have this, right? And they need to know what's normative. And it's not just, great, give me all the steps to take and I'll step in every step. So and I'm, it's not accusing, it's just saying, it's wonderful that your research and presentation allows for lucidity in these discussions. Now, leveling class that we have is, I think, going to address mm -hmm. that bottom. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Back from uh, one learner, yes, sir. Because I already taken the free class of Dr. Chia, yeah, yeah. and uh, talking about the Monday platform application into the course with me, I prefer when we have different platform like that. Yeah. Because um, actually, before when I work in the industry, yes. So when all the time we work with the financial modeling, yeah. My boss, he always require me to run the different modeling in different program. Like a second at opinion, right? SAS, <laughs> at that time, I, I, yeah. we mostly use SAS, right. but then he required uh, maybe you can run on Excel or yeah. on Stata, yeah. if possible, and for that we check for the result because we never <clears throat> know that our coding had any problem right. or the analytic uh, inside we have some kind of critical problem. Sure. So uh, when I learned the first core, the data mining, we use the two different parallelly do two different program. Uh, R and rabbit miner, and all the time when I generate for the results, when I see like okay they just slightly different or they completely identical, I feel really so comfort confident about my analytic results. Yeah, yeah, right. That's really so I mean yeah. beneficial. But when we jump into the forecasting class, so at that time uh, the rabbit miner is not really designed for the forecasting purpose. So we I mean mainly use the R Studio. And all the time when I generate, I just feel like, okay, I can kind of come back and to make the comparison in my analytic result. So I, I mean like from both the learner perspective um, uh, and also in the industry application, we all have to use a different, have to learn and use different kind of tool. That's beneficial for for me, because I really want to learn and yeah. want to apply them for my future career path. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Also Thank says you. it's not deterministic. Even the bosses aren't. I don't know if I can trust this. Because <laughs> 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 I'm the I'm before I the data and SAS user. Yeah. And when I. One of my friends, mm -hmm. at, at that time, but back to the 2015 and yeah. meeting to email about the R Studio, mm -hmm. and I switch. So I, right at that time, I just pull on my Facebook data, right? Okay, I finally figured out <laughs> the solution for everything. Right. So of course, like for the people, they they train over time about their preference about what they want to do for the analytic right. part. Uh, but we just have to keep updated for that. Okay. Your feedback, uh, all right, I will talk a little bit about my comparison, uh, my research topic, and how uh, the real data mining project can be applied for the industry uh, of using it for test. Um, so, my research was mostly about the credit scoring, or um, as also known as the credit risk evaluation. It's a very sound, interesting process, like P 
people just need to identify the different group of borrower into the different two group the good payer who will pay back uh, they lower not actually lowering after the due date or the bad payer who will have their they lower going to default um, so because this process uh, is really important uh, important operation for all the bank we account for up to the 60 percent of all the operational timing and activity of them so it brings a lot of problem when the bank uh, i mean the credit scoring system has a problem like they will create a lot of high credit risk uh, which has a loss and lower competitive um, ability compared to the market uh, competitor but however when a bank have very good and accurate model for credit scoring for classification they get the better i mean competitive advantage again to they are they are the rival uh, they can minimize the low and default lose and they can maximize for the lending profits and enforce for the lender activity um, I just want to share something about that I talked a few days ago with one of my friends who are doing the a startup in fintech financial technology and uh, this is an Australian based company who had just filed like about five six years ago another time they told me about it but when just like two or three days ago when I talked with him and now they have developed a lot and they are running something called credit scoring 2.5 to 2.0 so I say okay what exactly the the credit scoring 2.0 that's your company up lion and he said okay just forget about the traditional method for the risk evaluation scorecast that's most the bad at using traditionally that's a very inaccuracy uh subjective and uh, not so good process so now we move into a platform of data mining um that's a great guy i mean they are occupied a very high proportion of the market the fintech in my country like in in our country um the big client will be 14 different banks over 90 all the banks that operating in my country so uh, they just make a big jump and uh, the cto they graduate from ut austin and the ceo is a phd from Rhine university so they just really so futuristic um okay so in order to see how the data mining can be applied for classification method, a classification application like that, we design for research design. Uh, we go from the data collection into reprocessing. We do the modeling evaluation using the two different methods, like the confusion metric, a very traditional method in classification and multi color simulation. Um, all right. I guess that I was with to our studio to show your guy how to conduct I mean, some stuff that I conducted on my computer all right, in the analytic process. So you can see over here one of the big thing, I mean, big advantages that I learned when I started for our studio is that they provide the integrated library online. So uh, before when I use SAS and Stata, sometimes I have to create my own algorithm by myself, recode it and find the code somewhere on online. But when I switch into our studio, they just be available there and they be, will be integrated in a function that you have just pulled out and apply to your database. So that should be very beneficial for me. And uh, just imagine about the people who don't have a lot of background in statistic or in programming they can easily answer users so it's quite a scary right here for this project if I give up to like 20 different packet but uh, it's not that hard and very easy to pull out okay and uh, also when I try to retrieve the data I had two options I can do the coding also our studio also provide me an interface so for this way, I can just uh, browse for my for my file and just import them into RStudio. Very convenient. Um, 
The other thing is that right after when I have the data, I can take a look. The first thing about the first impression about the data, so I can see the structure of the data. So how many observations they are including the data sets, how many variable, what will be the characteristic of the variable very quickly. The same thing, I can see the dimension, how many observations, the variable number. I can have the first descriptive uh, analysis running in just like a second. And I can see all the like five quantized, uh, the medium, the mean of the all variable. I remember that's when I used the SES before and this data. That's a kind of like click interface and it took me a lot of time to record them all. <laughs> so right now everything is just for one click and I'm so glad about that. Okay, and uh, then the the next thing that I feel really so great when I do the analysis on R is that they also give me the chance to do the coding, the real coding, because it's R is also a programming language, it's a very convenient and very similar way for people to create their own function. So the same way what we have done on C++ or C sharp. So uh, if they are not available, you can create it. So that remind me about the one of the function of macro VBA in the Excel, <coughs> but it in the much higher advanced level, and it's really so hard to create. It. You don't want to learn it. <laughs> to be honest, I just get rid of that. And so I can create my own function, and right here I apply it to identify the missing value and replay them. Just very quickly, and we show you guys to see on the R Studio. So, I have the data sets. I want to check for the how many percent will be the missing value for each variable. I have the table, but it's not so really so clear and hard to imagine. So, R also provides every strong and powerful tool for the data visualization. And this is the main thing for uh, a VA company because it's your client, your customer sometimes not really so really friendly with the number, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to see the graph. And this is what R is so good for. They create a very easy to adjust, adjustable graph, very <coughs> and good for the performance. Okay. They can also, for our studio, they can also, when I conduct for the COVID, I can also build my